Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. My hope is that you remember that names are important in the Word of God. We learned in the first session that Haggai's name means my festivals. And until now, we have not seen any reference to any festival whatsoever. But that is going to change when we open up to chapter 2. So I would invite you to do just that. To take out your copy of God's Word, open it up to Haggai chapter 2, and we'll begin together with verse 1. We read here in the seventh, and obviously he's talking about the seventh month. And one of the things that stands out concerning the seventh month is all the holidays. We know that the first chapter, both at the beginning and at the end, it emphasized the sixth month, a month of preparation, a month of repentance, turning to God in light of the appointed days of the Lord. So the seventh month is full of festivals. But the question that we have to answer is, what festival are we going to confront first? And in verse 1, it says, in the seventh, the seventh month, and the 21st day of the month. Now, that is a special day. It is the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And that last day is seen, and there's a reference to this as well, in the New Testament, in the book of John in chapter 7. That last day is called that great day by John's gospel. In Hebrew, we call it Hoshana Rabbah, which means great salvation. And this is how chapter 2 begins. We have the first festival. There has to be, it's in the plural, Haggai, my festivals. There has to be two that are going to be alluded to. The first one speaks about great salvation. And through that day, what is taught, what is experienced on that last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, it foreshadows the kingdom of God. Because salvation leads us into a kingdom experience. So chapter 2 begins with this contextual aid to help us to understand what this second chapter is all about, the salvation of the Lord, his great salvation. Once more, verse 1. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, once more it says, and the word of the Lord was literally in the hand, that term of authority, of the prophet Haggai saying, Say now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shatiel, the governor of Judah, and to Yahshua, the son of Yehoshadak, the high priest, and to, once more, this all-important remnant, this group, the minority, that also heard the word of the Lord. His summoning to the people, get ready for what God is about to do through the work of the people. Now, when we look at these individuals, these two men, and we mention that the high priest, Yahshua, he is the son of one that is called Yeho Sadak, which speaks about the Lord, the righteousness, the righteousness of the Lord the God of Israel. But what's also interesting is Zerubbabel. This man, the son of Shaltiel, means ass from God. 
And this should be our mindset. That we ask for God his righteousness. That is the prayer that should be our daily plea before him. That we express righteousness in how we walk, how we think. And we are an instrument that executes righteousness in this world. The prophet Zachariah, Zechariah, he was a contemporary of this individual, Haggai. And Zechariah spoke frequently in his prophecy about that same call to execute justice, righteousness in this world. So he speaks once more to the remnant of the people saying, who among you, I'm in verse 3, who among you that remains, which saw the house, that is the temple, this temple with its glory, and then we have the word, the first. And that word, the grammatical construction, speaks about the first house, that previous temple, the one that Malik Shlomo, King Solomon built, and all of its glory. So Haggai, he speaks to the two leaders, Zerubbabel, Yahushua, and that remnant of the people. And he asks the question, who remembers, who among this group remembers the glory of this first temple and how it was? And then he continues, what do you see with it now? In other words, he's saying, how does this temple, this one that has been rebuilt, this one that now stands at the same location on the temple mount, he says, now what do you see? How would you describe it? And notice what he says. What is it like? Ke'ain be'anechem, which means it is like nothing in our eyes. That second temple was not nearly as glorious as the first. But notice what's happening. God is going to use that, that work of the remnant with human eyes. And it's so important that we see this. It says in our eyes, it was as though it was nothing. But God can take what we do that we feel is nothing, insignificant of no value, no consequence. And what we're going to see is God's going to do something. It's all about how God takes our work and turns it into something which is pleasing to him. Verse 4. And now Zerubbabel, be strong, declares the Lord. Be strong, Yeshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the priest, the high priest. Be strong, all the people of the land. Now, we really need to ask ourselves how that should be translated. Because when we look here, it's the word arts. But that same word may not be referring to simply the land, meaning the land of Israel, but perhaps the entire earth. And many of the commentators see that this term has great significance. That God is going to do something what we thought was so insignificant. That was nothing in our eyes. God's going to do a work in that place that is going to affect all the world. So it's interesting. He speaks to Zerubbabel, to Yahushua, but there's a change. He says also to all the people of the earth, declares the Lord. And then he says a second time, basically, they did, meaning they did the work. For I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. Now, what's significant about here is, it's the second time he says, I am with you. And if we are a good student of looking at these two places where he says that, what do they have in common? They did the work. If you want God to be with you, then you do his work. It is only when we do in obedience what God has instructed us, his call for us, 
that we should have an expectation that God will be present in our life. We need to realize that it's obedient work that seems as an invitation to the Lord. He sees our work as an invitation to Him to get involved in our life, in our circumstances. So they, look at the middle of verse 4. They did, meaning they did the work. For I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. Verse 5. The word which I cut with you when you went forth from Egypt. Now, the reason why I said I cut That word is usually used within the context of making a covenant. So he speaks about the word that he cut, and that is an idiom for making a covenant. The covenant that they embraced at Mount Sinai when God gave them his instructions. And what is that all in reference to? Well, whenever, and I want to say that again, Whenever there's a reference to the exodus from Egypt, what should come into our mind? Redemption. God made a word, a covenant with the people through redemption. And redemption is related to worship and ultimately redemption gives us that kingdom invitation, that kingdom experience. So as we look in the second chapter of Haggai, we see that redemption is being made We see that there is a broader context, not just the land of Israel, but according to most of the sages of Israel, it goes beyond. This has worldwide implications to it. This work that they did that they thought was small and insignificant in their eyes. He says, the word which I cut with you when you went forth from Egypt, my spirit It stands in your midst, and therefore he says, do not, and in this case it means, do not be afraid. And what's the difference? We saw in chapter 1 about fearing the Lord, making his will the priority of our life. Well, now he's saying something else. Because I am with you, do not be afraid of the enemy. Do not be afraid of the opponents, those who stand in opposition. And this tells us something. There will be, and don't miss this, there will be great opposition in the last days. Do not fear the enemy. Do not give them any priority, any of your thoughts. Remain focused upon the instructions of God. Remember Hold fast to the promises of God, what he's going to do that's going to have a worldwide change, bringing about a kingdom experience to this world. Verse 6, for thus said the Lord of hosts, in one little while, and I like how it's expressed, in one little while he's going to do something. Now, we're going to see what he's doing here in verse 6, but he's going to do it, or at least speak of it, again. So the first time, we get a general context. We see that it surrounds redemption. It surrounds the promises of God, God bringing in us into the fullness of his kingdom expectations for his people. And what is going to take place for that event to happen For it to become a reality, notice what he says. For thus said the Lord. Now, if you've been listening, most English Bibles, they ignore the simple grammar. They will say, thus says the Lord in the present. But it's not. It's in the past to show something. That what God is saying, it is as good as done. We can have assurance. We can be confident that this is going to happen and what's he going to do in a little while and i don't think that's ever more true than it's been today in a little while i am shaking the heavens and the earth 
Now, whenever we see that expression, heavens and the earth, we need to be drawn back to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. Because the first account where the phrase heavens and earth appears, obviously, it's in the creation account. And this is what God's going to do. He is going to do a work of creation, a new heaven and a new earth. He's speaking about a change, a kingdom change that is coming. So we read here, I am shaking the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. I will shake, notice this, all the nations. Now, the, the sages, when we go back earlier to when he says, I'm speaking this to Zerubbabel and Yahushua and all the people of the earth. The reason why those sages said this is broader. It's not just speaking about the people of the land, the land of Israel. But beyond that is because they read in verse 7 where he says, I'm going to shake all the nations. What God's up to? Again, worldwide implications. I will shake all the nations and they will come. And the implication is they're coming, they're bringing the, the desire of all the nations, their very best. And I will fill my house, this house, with glory, said the Lord of hosts. It speaks about how that house, that temple, and remember the context. The first thing that, that Haggai said, all of you who are with us this day, who among you that remains? Who among you remembers that first house and all of its glory, that first temple? And when they looked at that house, the one that had just been built, it was so disappointing at first. But God says he's going to do something. He is going to fill that house with the desire of all the world. He says, look now at verse 8. For the silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. For great, and I would emphasize this ninth verse. For great will be the glory of this house. But what house is he speaking to? Notice that word. It is the word, acharon, which means the last. Now, he's not speaking about the temple, in the time of Zerubbabel, the time of Haggai. But it was because they did that work. And even though in their eyes it seemed insignificant, that temple, that house, it was going to be used by God for a very important purpose. And what is that? For the first coming of the Messiah. They saw it as insignificant in comparison to the past. But that temple, it was going to be used mightily by God. And because of that, we're going to arrive, and don't miss this, at another temple, that final temple, that one that is going to be related to the millennial kingdom. This is what Haggai is speaking about. This verse that we just read about him shaking the heavens and the earth and all the nations, never has this happened before as it's going to in this prophecy, the fulfillment of it. And God is going to fill this house, this final house. Notice what he says again, verse 9. Great. And this speaks about splendor, majesty. That which is exceedingly great. For great will be the glory of this house, this last. Even more so, it says, than the first. Said the Lord of hosts. It's his promise. And in this place, I will give. And what is he going to give? He is going to give. The word is shalom. And it just doesn't mean peace. If you understand that as simply the absence of, of violence and wars, 
you're, you're selling yourself short. This word shalom is all about the fulfillment of God's will. And what we are experience, what we will experience when God's will, ultimately his kingdom will, is fulfilled in this world. That is that implication that he was talking about, bringing about when he shakes this world, all of it in the nations. So he says, in this place. Now this is futuristic. It has not been fulfilled. It's going to be. And that's why it's not hard to understand. In this place, what place? Jerusalem. And where in Jerusalem? The Temple Mount. God has an important future for that. And that's why, and I know that I repeat myself often, but you don't know the emails that I get. And they will say, you focus too much about the land of Israel. You know why I do? Because God's word focuses in on it for the future. Not just the past, but for the future. What future? A kingdom future. See, when someone is so unwise that he or she says there's no more relevance for the land of Israel, for Jerusalem. That person is not someone who takes seriously the word of God, studying it. That person does not have reverence for the authority of Scripture. This is not speaking now in Haggai chapter 2 about what was, but what will be. And he says, in this place, I will give, and he hasn't done that yet. I will give shalom, declares the Lord of hosts. Now look at verse 10. Verse 10 is when it becomes exciting. Now, some people will say that, that this prophecy, it is going back. Many things have transpired. That temple's been built and such, and that would have taken much time, perhaps, other scholars say, no, because of the inferiority, they did it very quickly. However you want to understand it, we see beginning in verse 10 that we go back to just three months later, only three months later than when this prophecy began. But there's a very important date. Now, remember, Haggai, my festivals. Remember what I said early on in the first session. It is John's gospel that, that evaluates Hanukkah and, and gives it, sets it on the same status spiritually as Passover and tabernacles and also it hints towards Shavuot or Pentecost. The Shalosh Regalim, these three pilgrim festivals, Hanukkah, according to John's gospel, is put on this same level. The question that one who reads John's gospel should be asking themselves is why is that? And that's why. It is so unfortunate. It is sad. It should grieve you inwardly when so many people who say, I love Yeshua, I'm a follower of Jesus of Nazareth, I've been born again, and Hanukkah, this is nothing for me. It's about other people, long time ago in another place. It's about the past. No, it is not. Hanukkah speaks about the future. What happened nearly 2,200 years ago gives us a paradigm, a lens to see what God's going to do. And why do I say that? Well, there is going to be an emphasis. How do I know that? There's going to be a repeating over and over and over of a particular date. And it's that date that foreshadows the second festival that we've been searching for. We had the first one during the Feast of Tabernacles, Hoshana Rabbah. And now, notice what it says in verse, verse 10. On the 24th day of the ninth month. You know when that was this year? Last Thursday. 
And what did believers who take serious all of God's word, what did we do that day at the end of it? Right before the, the day was coming to an end, it is the preferred time for one to light the Hanukkah, the what's oftentimes spoken of as a menorah. Menorah is just that lamp. A Hanukkah is a menorah specifically for the festival of Hanukkah. And why did it begin at that time? Why? Notice what it says. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Daryavish, same year, three months later, the word of the Lord was in the hand, the same authority that he received by God, from God. The word of the Lord was in the hand of Haggai, the prophet, saying, Thus said the Lord of hosts, Ask now. Now, he's going to give a question to the Kohanim, the priest. And the Kohanim figured greatly in Hanukkah. And we're going to find that there's significance in why he turned to the priest because the priests, they were supposed to be teaching priests, teaching them about that which is holy and that which is profane. So he asked them a question God does through this prophet. Verse 11. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask please the priests, Torah, meaning ask them a question concerning the Torah. He's testing them. And the question and their answer is most informative to us. Verse 12. Behold, a man carries holy Meat, Basar Kodesh. Holy meat in the border of his garment. And he touches with his border of his garment bread and then lentils or stew and then wine and then oil and all these food. He has a question. All of this food do they become holy? Do they, because they're touched by this sanctified meat, do they change? Does that holy meat impart holiness to this food? That's the question. And notice what they answer, middle of verse 12. The priests answered, and they said, no. Verse 13. And Haggai said, if one will touch Tamei Nefesh, that is the impurity of an individual. Usually that is an idiom for, for one that's touched a dead body. And with all of these things, the implication is he touches. Do they become unclean? And the priest answered and said, yes, they become unclean. Now, what we see here is a problem. This sanctified meat, this relates to something connected to what? Well, the emphasis of the book of Haggai, and I hope you've seen this. The emphasis of the book of Haggai is the temple. God says, build it so he could be worshipped. That work would go on there. But the question is this. Does that temple impart holiness to things? It doesn't. It is a place for the holy God. We are to worship him. But the temple does not impart holiness to us. But the problem is this. If there is something that is tame, something that is unclean, impure, that's what Tame means. If we encounter this, then we are rendered unclean. And that status of being unclean speaks about a distance, a separation from God. And notice what he says after the priests are examined. Look now, if you would, to verse 14. And on account of this, Haggai answered, 
Thus are these people. Thus is this nation before me, says the Lord. What does that mean? They're unclean. And they do not have the capacity to be changed by the temple. Build it. You worship God. But that in and of itself is not going to bring about any change. Verse verse 14. Thus, in the middle of the verse, thus this people, thus are this nation before me, declares the Lord. Thus is all the work of their hands, which they bring near to me. There it is impure. There's no change. Something's got to change if there's going to be hope for the people. Verse 15, a familiar statement. We encountered it several times in chapter 1. He's going to say it again. And now... Pay attention, set your hearts from this day and onward. Now, what day are we talking about? Well, the reason why the date's not mentioned here, because it was mentioned previously, and it's going to be mentioned again emphatically in a moment. But the lack of it puts an emphasis. It wants us to ponder. What day is he talking about? And we don't have to guess he's going to tell us, but we know. If you study this, it is that 24th day of the ninth month. By the way, we need to realize that Hanukkah is in that ninth month, the month that's called Kislev. So this verse 15. And now pay attention, set your hearts from this day and forward. From before was placed a stone upon a stone in the Hechel Hashem. That is the sanctuary of the Lord. Another reference to the temple. Now he says, remember, pay attention. Put your mind on this. That from this date, even before anything was done, no building had taken place. Verse 16. From the day that came, Two, notice what it says, when you came, and this means to the temple, the day you came to this, this stack, this heap, and you expected 20, and there was what? Only 10. And you came to the, the winery, the wine vat, and you wanted to, to receive 50, 50 of this, this liquid, this, this produce from the wine vat, and there was only 20. Now, there was an expectation, but there was no fulfillment. There was that which was lacking. And we see that impurity brings about that which diminishes. That's the message here. When we are impure, it does not produce what it should. There is a lacking. And this should cause us to remember what we've studied earlier. And what was that? That temple, that second one was lacking. It was diminishing. It wasn't what the people was hoping for. It was sad in their eyes. And all of this is to tell us we want change. We want a difference. And what is that difference going to be? Look now to verse 17. I will strike you with, and this is a word for a a blast of hot air, with mildew, with hail, and with all, all the works of your hands. Why? There is no one with you unto me, meaning there's really none of you that are turning to me. None of you are seeking me properly, declares the Lord. Verse 18. How many times has he said this? Set your hearts, pay attention from this day and forward. From what day? From the day, the 24th day of the ninth month. Now, would you not agree that that's being emphasized? 
It is an important date. And what is that? Well, we call today Erev Chanukah. It is the day before Chanukah begins. And always Erev, whatever, has great significance. It tells us to be ready, to get prepared for something. For one of the appointed times. And with an appointed time comes God's activity. It reminds us of what he did do on that date. But also, there's a kingdom fulfillment of these festivals. And this is what it's foreshadowing. Look again at verse 18. Set your hearts from that day and forward. From the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day, and now we see significance, from the day which the temple of the Lord, this sanctuary of the Lord, was founded. Set your hearts. Now, what he's speaking about is something very important. Laying on that 24th day of the ninth month, that is when they laid the foundation for that temple. That temple in the days of Zerubbabel. That one that they thought was nothing, that was insignificant, that was not going to produce anything. God says, wait. I'm going to take that which is nothing in your eyes, and it is going to, in the end, ha'acharon, in the end, it is going to have a wondrous, a glorious outcome. Now, what this is mentioned is the foundation. And when I hear this word, yesod, foundation, I think of the prophet Isaiah that talks about him laying a foundation in Zion. And one that stumbles over this one is going to be destroyed. But the one who does not he will never be ashamed. He is going to, in other words, have satisfaction. He's not going to know regret, but he is going to know the fulfillment of the promises of God. There is no doubt in my mind why the foundation is emphasized. Because the foundation of our faith, the rock of our salvation is Yeshua. The scripture says, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day, that very day, when the foundation was laid of the sanctuary of the Lord, he says, pay attention. Verse 19. He says, when still the seed was in the barn, and the vine, and the fig, and the pomegranate, and the olive tree, they, they did not uh, give. They did not produce anything. But from that day, this day, what does he say? I will bless. Now, I don't know about you, but, but I think oftentimes the people who are best able to understand the word of God are, are those that have a very simple mind because we don't try to figure it out we just hear what is said and when i look at this i can't help but put emphasis on what he's saying see when god says i'm going to give you a time that i'm going to bless the seed still in the barn it's before any of the the fruits of the field give any produce before you have anything physical, tangible, I'm going to bless. And when is he going to do that? He's going to do that. The expectation for that is this foundation, the 24th day of the ninth month. That is Erev Chanukah, the eve of Chanukah, the day that leads up to it. And what's he going to do? Why is this important? How is he going to bless? We'll now go to verse 20. And it will be, or it will come about, 
as it literally says, the word of the Lord a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. Now again, do you not see that that number 24 over and over and over? And by the way, the number 24 is a kingdom number. That's how many elders that are going to be in the kingdom of God in the new Jerusalem. So it's this 24th day of great significance. Verse 21, say to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah. He's the leader. It is a, a position of authority. Say to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah. And what's he going to do? Well, remember, I would make a note of verse 6. There's something very similar between chapter 2, verse 6, and chapter 2, verse, verse 21. He says something very, very similar. Say to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, I am shaking the heavens and the earth. What's that? Creation. There's going to be a new creation. And again, we're speaking about the kingdom of God. There is a relationship between this day, the 24th day of the ninth month, Erev Hanukkah, and revelation about the kingdom of God. Now, you know what that tells me? It tells me that Hanukkah is connected. In some way, we'll learn more about the kingdom of God. He says, I am shaking the heavens and the earth, verse 22. And I will, and I like this, this is what we should be waiting for. Verse 22, I will vehafakti, I will overturn. It is a word of change. It's a word of bringing destruction with a new beginning. It's that same word that describes Nineveh when they heard and sought the grace of God. He says, I will overturn the throne of the kingdoms and I will destroy the power of the kingdoms of the nations. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. And I hope this is not a hard question. Who is going to, in actuality, destroy the nations and their kingdom? Very simple. That is what Messiah is going to do when he returns. When he comes at the end of the last days, that final seven years, he is coming and he's coming with wrath and he is going to overturn this world and destroy, destroy the kingdoms of the nations. He says, doesn't matter how strong they are. He says, same word, I will overturn the chariot and its rider and the horse and, and their riders. They're going to be brought down. And a man with his sword, his brother, meaning this, that they are going to not fight God. God is going to come and he is going to cause such confusion. He's done this in the past. He'll do it in the future. He is going to cause such confusion that the armies, they're going to turn and, and slay one another. And then God will bestow his consuming eternal wrath upon them. Verse 23. Beyom hahu, in that day. This is a reference to judgment. If you haven't seen all the significance, the hints, the grammatical clues, the vocabulary that causes us to put this in a last day context, this is quite clear. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take Zerubbabel and Zerubbabel and the rabbinical scholars say this, and the Christian scholars say this. Don't take my word for it. Go through Christian commentaries on Haggai. They all, they all, they all say that Zerubbabel is a typology for who? Hamashiach, the Messiah. There's been such an emphasis upon this man, and notice what it says concerning him. 
I will take Zerubbabel, Shatiel, the son of Shatiel, ass from God. Seek Messiah. I will take Zerubbabel, the son of Shatiel, and then I would highlight this next word, Avdi. Avdi is my servant. Now, again, if you're a student of prophecy, I don't need to say anything to you because you will be reminded of the fact that prophets like Ezekiel uses this term, Avdi, to speak about Messiah. This is a clue from the text itself. If you haven't picked up that Zerubbabel is a typology of Messiah, this confirms it for you. So he says, I will take this one, Zerubbabel, the son of Shatiel, my servant, declares the Lord. And I will set you as a, and this is a seal, but in actuality, it's like a singlet reign, one that marks authority, that, that speaks of a promise that has, has the signature, the signing of who? Well, who's speaking? God is. And God is saying, Zerubbabel, he is going to be used, and he's a typology, a paradigm for Messiah. I will take him. I will set him as a seal, for in you I have chosen. And who's going to fulfill this prophecy? It is Messiah Yeshua. I have set him as a seal, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord. Now, all of this, all of this has caused those because of the date, the 24th day of the ninth month. All that we read, I will shake the earth and the heavens. This has worldwide implications. I am going to give peace. All of this tells the scholars that this prophecy is about the last days. And it tells us that Hanukkah in some way is connected to the last days. And the question you should be wanting to have answered is, how? How is it connected? Well, there's a few more places. We're going to be wrapping up in just a few short minutes, but there's two more places I want us to talk about. One is, and I've mentioned it as we began, the Gospel of John, chapter 10. Now, many times we see that Messiah spoke not just about the biblical revelation, but he oftentimes addressed those from their traditions, their views, the traditions of the elders, the, the interpretations of the sages. He spoke to that. And in John chapter 9, excuse me, John chapter 10, verse 22, Yeshua goes up to Jerusalem for Hanukkah. It is winter time. And what does he do? He paces. He walks back and forth. That's the implication of the grammar. He walks back and forth in what place? Ulam Shlomo, which is the place that King Solomon, remember him? He built the first temple. But this was the closest place that he could go, closest to the Holy of Holies. It was the place, the entrance, the last place where one could be before entering sacred territory. And Messiah was in that place. Why? There's an anticipation because of eight, eight days of Hanukkah, eight, the number of kingdom, eight, the number of new beginning, eight, the number of redemption. And it was for this reason that Hanukkah always had an expectation. What type of expectation? A messianic expectation. And that's why Yeshua is there in that location. And the leaders gather around. And what did they ask? How long are you going to keep us in suspense? Tell us plainly whether you are the Messiah or not. Now, what do they want? They didn't want a word. They wanted an action. Because... On one Hanukkah, Mashiach, Yeshua, Jesus Christ. He is going to 
enter into the Holy of Holies. He is going to sit on that caport, that mercy seat between the two cherubim where the very presence of God dwelt. And when he does that, the kingdom of God is going to be inaugurated, dedicated. Hanukkah is a great word. For example, it appears in a different uh, form. But in Proverbs 22.6, train up, that's the word Hanukkah. Train up, dedicate a child in the way that he should go. Hanukkah speaks about the right way. God's way. And when Messiah enters into that place, the Holy of Holies, and this is why the Antichrist corrupted it. That's why he tried to give a false, a false counterfeit. That's what he'll do. The Antiochus Epiphanes gave a a paradigm of that, but the Antichrist, that's what he's going to do when he commits the abomination of desolation. So in John chapter 10, The leadership was saying, if you're the Messiah, go in, show us, give us evidence. But he didn't come the first time to inaugurate the kingdom. But when he comes back, he will. Now, no one knows the day or the hour when Messiah will gather up his followers. But we do know, that's speaking about the blessed hope. But we do know that Messiah will the second time the second coming at the end will be coming back with him at that time. Read 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. We'll be with him. And he's going to come. And this is what the scripture says, our last scripture. Look, if you would, to the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel and chapter 12. We'll be done in just a moment. The book of Daniel and chapter 12. Now, this chapter deals with the last days. Everyone agrees about that. The time, it's mentioned here, the end times. And notice what he says, verse 11. And from the time that the tamid, that daily sacrifice, is removed. What's going to cause the daily sacrifice in that third temple, the Antichrist temple, to, to be removed? It tells us. Shikuts Shomem. What's that? The abomination of desolation. That is something that's important because he says, from that time of the removal of the daily sacrifice by the abomination of desolation, the work of the Antichrist, there is going to be, what does he say? 1,290 days. Now, that should be surprising to you because normally, We find in the book of Revelation, we find elsewhere in the book of Daniel, it's 1,260. This is an additional 30 days. And the number 30 relates to mourning. If you say shloshim, the term shloshim speaks about a mourning period. So we have an additional 30 days mourning. And then after that day, look at verse 12. But blessed or happy is the one who waits and arrives at what? At 1,335 days. Why is that important? Because that is additional 45. So we have 30 plus 45, that's 75. Why is that important? Because if you look at Zechariah, It speaks about a day, a day of washing away the impurity of the children of Israel. Their tameh, their tum'ah. And what's important about that? That day that is set aside in the calendar, the biblical calendar, the appointed day, is Yom Kippur. And there is 75 days always, always on the biblical calendar between Yom Kippur and Hanukkah. So when we look at this, this extra 75 days, it speaks of, remember something else. 75 is also related to redemption. Why do I say that? There is exactly, when we look at Luke's genealogy, between the Son and God himself, there are 75 names. 75 speaks of redemption. Redemption. 
In the Torah, in the book of Genesis, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, according to the Septuagint, 75 went down to, to Egypt. And what did God do? He built a people that he redeemed out of there. So 75 relates to redemption, it relates to the kingdom, and it relates to a period of time when the kingdom of God is going to be inaugurated. Yes, indeed, Hanukkah is very important. It is a day that we should learn about, that we should mark, that we should use as a testimony, a testimony concerning the promises of God to shake this earth, to destroy the wicked empires of the nations and replace them with a kingdom. He is going to lay a foundation. Remember that 24th day of the ninth month. He is going to lay a foundation and that foundation of that kingdom is Messiah Yeshua who is going to rule as King Messiah forever and ever. And where is he going to rule from for those thousand years of the millennial kingdom? He is going to do so from the Holy of Holies. His throne is going to be on the Ark of the Testimony. Hanukkah has great significance. Well, I'll close with that. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Shalom from Israel.